This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is George Packer. His new book is The Unwinding, An Inner History of the New America. George, welcome to Berkeley. It's great to be here. Where were you born and raised? Uh, down in Stanford, the, the rival. Uh, I grew up on campus. My parents were both faculty members and I lived 18 years in that idyllic place before leaving for good when I graduated from high school. And uh, where were you educated? I went to Yale. I got a, a BA, went off to the Peace Corps uh, in West Africa, a little tiny village, and that was the end of my formal education. Mm -hmm. and, and your mother was a, a professor of creative writing at Stanford. Yes, she was a short story writer. She still is. She actually just published uh, her latest book at age 87. Um, and she taught in the English department and ran the creative writing program for a while. My father was in the law school and then became an administrator. He was the vice provost just in time for the revolution of uh, 67, 68. So I grew up in a, in a family of writers and of politically minded people. You're, you have an earlier book which I would like to talk about because I, it's called uh, Blood of the Liberals. It was published in 2000 and it's a, it's a book about uh, your uh, coming to terms with uh, the political tradition that uh, your, your family was a part of. Uh, both uh, your, your grandfather was uh, an important progressive congressman from Alabama and, and your, your, uh, your father was a a distinguished uh, liberal lawyer. Uh, talk a little about that because it, it was important for you to, to shape your identity, and it, it's an elaborate process, looking back at the tradition that they were a part of. Yeah, my mother's father, George Huddleston, was a congressman from Birmingham, Alabama, from Wilson to Roosevelt. And he came out of an old tradition of populism that goes back to Jefferson uh, and forward to William Jennings Bryan and Robert La Follette. And it, it, his career is a reminder that back in the teens and 20s and 30s, there were real radicals at the highest levels of, of government in Congress. And, and he was one of them. But his radicalism was just as suspicious of Roosevelt's New Deal as it was of J.P. Morgan and the Trust. So he ended up losing out to a New Dealer in 1936. So that is one strain of liberalism in this country. It's very old. It, it flourished in the South and in the Midwest. There's another strain which is more urban and more modern um, which my father represented. He was Jewish. He grew up in the Northeast, uh, was one of the Jews to survive the barriers and get into Yale in spite of its quotas. He fought in World War II. And then he was um, a legal scholar who ran afoul of um, Herbert Hoover and the witch hunters of the 50s because he wrote a book about ex Al Alger Hiss and other ex-communists uh, and other communists who were... Um, who were outed by ex-communists. His book didn't find his innocent, but it was enough of a study of what went wrong in the pursuit of the, um, the communists of that period that it uh, sort of branded him uh, a lefty. He was not, he was a liberal. My family's full of liberals uh, who are sort of the most vulnerable political species uh, in our country. And my father's career came up against um, 
a different kind of radicalism in the 60s when he was a, a Stanford administrator during the student revolution and that was kind of the end of his career and ultimately he, he fell ill with a stroke and that was the end of his, his life too. So the book, The Blood of the Liberals, looks at these past generations to try to understand how did liberalism flourish and fail during the 20th century. So the, by, by the time I was an adult, it hardly even seemed to have a pulse as a as a vibrant political movement in this country. And and you your your family was very much influenced by the events at Stanford in the in the protests against the Vietnam War in the sense that uh, 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 Stanford was confronted by the new radicalism that was emerging in protests uh, to the war. Yeah, my father was a he was a believer in procedure. Um, he was a, a scholar of criminal law. He believed in argument, and what he found was the students who he was running up against as an administrator um, seemed to want to dispense with reason. At, altogether, which they in some cases regarded as like a tool of power. It was kind of the beginning of a postmodern critique of the Enlightenment and of reason on the part of the left. And for my father, this was abhorrent. He saw in their appeals to feeling um, something frighteningly like some of the, you know, the ideologies of Europe that, that brought the continent into a conflagration. So he was um, he, he saw sit-ins as being coercive and against the tradition of academic and intellectual freedom. He was that kind of a liberal, an ACLU liberal, a free speech liberal, um, but not uh, a believer in overthrowing established institutions. He was a reform liberal. And that kind of liberal died in the 60s and 70s and has, you know, in, in a sense, we've been waiting for its revival ever since. You, you write, uh, you say, yeah. I was trying to sift through the ruins of liberalism to seek and choose a new mode of politics rather than live out the one I was born to. So, so this, this period that you were coming to your, uh, uh, to your maturity uh, really was a time in which the, the world was coming apart. Uh, 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 politically and so on. I had a strong sense as a child even that um, that the world was coming apart and that the the ideals and creed of my my forefathers was not strong enough to withstand it. I mean when I was eight years old I was keenly aware of the assassinations of King and Kennedy, the protests here at Berkeley, Stanford, Columbia, um, the Vietnam War, the, the body counts, um, drugs, and the Manson killings, and it just seemed like society was coming apart. And my father's faith in reason, I just had on an elemental level a sense that it didn't stand a chance without thinking it through in those terms because I was only eight. I just feared for the fragile world that I had been born into, that my parents had, had created kind of as a as a shelter, as a protection for, for me and for my sister. It just didn't seem able to stand up to what seemed like, um, you know, a world going mad. You, you say, in addition, no, uh, I, my generation has no Jefferson and no, de no New Deal to set our compass by. Right. And I think we've been, my whole adult life, which if you look at 18 as the beginning of it, has coincided with um, the rise of conservative power in Washington and business power across the country. Uh, I've been waiting for, looking for, thinking about how you could build a new reform liberal politics on the bones of the old, of the period from the progressives through the New Deal into the post-war social contract which, you know, I wasn't alive then, so I'm probably prone to, um, to romanticizing and to missing out on something. Obviously, there was massive injustice uh, committed against, you know, black Americans. Women had no opportunities. Gay Americans were non-people. But it was a social order that had the tools of self-correction. 
the institutions were healthy enough that they could fix what was wrong, and they did. They began to. Um, I've seen uh, those efforts at reform and at um, <clears throat> creating more equal opportunity rather than less come up against uh, the new power, which is not government, it's business. And I've been waiting for a politician or a politics to come up with a new version, because it never dies completely, of what Jefferson and the progressives and Roosevelt created. We haven't seen it. I thought maybe in 2008 Barack Obama was going to be that politician, but he, I think he was up against forces that were stronger than he is. You, you uh, after your undergraduate work, you went on an odyssey, really. Uh, let's talk a little about that, because I, uh, you, you, you end up as a writer. But before you did that, you essentially were in the Peace Corps. You worked in a homeless shelter. Uh, worked in uh, construction for a few years. Construction. Yeah. Uh, and what, what did you learn from that experience? And, and I, clearly you learned to be an observer at some point of the, these different worlds that were around you. I think a, a key experience for me was was living in a little village in Togo in West Africa, totally on my own, N no American near me, um, and trying to survive because I did not have the inner resources that it took to live in that kind of alien environment, in that kind of isolation. I was 22 all my life. I had been at one university or another. Uh, I'd been a, a good student. I had done well. I'd been rewarded. And suddenly there was nothing like that to sustain me. And um, I guess I felt to survive, I'm going to have to make connections to the people in this village. And I did learn a lot about how to listen to people from very different backgrounds and experiences. Uh, I was just intensely interested in them and never stopped asking them questions. Um, and it was partly because that was the only companionship I had and partly because um, it seemed like my life had been too limited. I really, it was necessary to kind of break it in order to find out what life was really about. It was sort of like an earlier, someone from an earlier generation maybe joining the army uh, or just going and traveling around the world. And um, it damn near killed me, but it was an incredible changing experience, and I think it was the beginning of my becoming a writer, learning to observe, learning to, in a sense, suppress um, my own inner reaction enough that I could render the visible world and the people around me vividly and concretely, which is what writers have to do. In the, at, at, when you're at the homeless shelter, you talk about going home and doing notes, writing up what had happened. Did that actually start in Africa? Were you doing it then? Or when When did, because clearly, as we'll talk about your new book, you really uh, 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 have an enormous talent to uh, for observing and then taking down what, what you're observing and what people are saying. You know, I kept a journal in Togo, but when I went back to it, um, in order to write a book, because my first book, The Village of Waiting, was about those years in Africa. Um, it was useless. It was just a record of my feelings, and it turned out that my feelings were not very interesting in retrospect. I, I remembered them. I knew what they were. But I also wrote lots of letters, and um, that, that was back when letters were still written. <laughs> I mean, this was such a different time, 1982, 3, 4, that you know, to make a phone call home, I, I needed weeks of preparation. Letters took six weeks to arrive. Of course, there was no internet, there were no cell phones. So that made the isolation pretty complete, but it also meant I had to pour a lot into the letters just to convey to people at home what I was doing. So I gathered up those letters when I set out to write The Village of Waiting, and they were a huge help in reconstructing scenes, characters, dialogue, description. And that, those are the building blocks of narrative. You, you say in this book that uh uh, liberals learn to adjust to reality. And then you also talk about the, the power of reason, you know, and, and it, what's striking about this book is you, you go visit your aunt 
and she's become an evangelical. And, and you really uh, can distance yourself, be objective, but paint a portrait of, of evangelicals and even wind up comparing it, them to the socialist, which you had been in, in the interim. Part of a group and, of and socialists. So, so, that, that, so, so writing, in a way, has allowed you to use the characteristics of a liberal, in a way. Is that mm. fair? You know, although you can't be a liberal in politics. You I think, um, I wouldn't go quite that far. I mean, obviously, there are great conservative writers. There are great liberal writers. There are bad liberal writers. Mm. I would say, to write well, <clears throat> it helps to have some framework for understanding life and some set of I ideals and values, but it also helps to be able to set them aside long enough to pay attention and to take in things that are going to run a counter to your idea of the way the world should be. Because otherwise you're, you're constantly eliding and erasing what you're seeing. And you're manipulating your portraits of people into, into stock figures and that's just bad prose, that's bad writing. I think some instinct has always told me whatever you may think about the world, the world is going to be a far more interesting and complicated place. And you'll get more out of it as a writer if you just stay alert and pay attention and don't try to make it conform to your expectations. Otherwise, among other things, it'll be boring. So, I mean, all of this was me learning to write. And the model was Orwell. I was reading Orwell all the time in my 20s. And he was like my graduate program. And my idea of a writer was someone who wrote autobiographically, like Orwell in his essays, and in Down and Out in Paris and London, Homage to Catalonia. I didn't have a notion of being a journalist, uh, of going out and interviewing people and recording uh, observations that didn't start with my own life. So my first few books were autobiographical. My first articles for magazines were essays. And it was only like at 40 when I moved to New York and began writing for The New Yorker and The New York Times Magazine that I, I really became a journalist. But, but the tools were already there. They were the same tools. And, and what, what I, I like to ask my guests, uh, what are the skills and temperament involved in what they do? You, you really helped us understand the skills. What about, what about the temperament of being a writer? I have, I think, a, a pretty passionate attachment to certain ideas which really are political ideas. I'm a political writer pretty much down to the marrow, um, which are a dislike of unfairness. I'm, I'm speaking basically here. I'm talking about kind of stuff that starts you know, on, the, on the playground. Um, a sympathy for the underdog. Um, an interest in what seems different and alien. Um, and a belief that underneath it, we're actually not that different. Because everywhere I've gone from Togo to Burma to Baghdad, um, I found it easy to talk to people and easy to hear, to get them to tell me their stories. And their stories are easily understandable as the aspirations of people like the people that I grew up with um, or people that I, that I know. So I guess I'm a universalist in that sense. And, and if that, that's not quite a temperament, but it is a sort of approach to life. I believe that, you know, above or beneath the, the differences in language, and in experience, I can understand you if I want to and if I try hard enough. And that means really empathizing, not pretending, because people immediately pick up insincerity in the intimate uh, bond that's established between a journalist and, and a subject. It has to be a real desire to know you. And I think I have a talent for, for getting people to talk to me and for getting to know them. And I think it's because they sense that, that I mean it. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what is your work process like? Uh, you, we'll talk about the book in a minute, but you, you, you follow uh, four main characters uh, uh, at, at different levels of society. 
uh, throughout the book. Uh, so it's talking with them, winning, identifying them, talking with them, winning their trust, recording what they're saying. But uh, you, you're suggesting also seeing in a way how they fit into a bigger picture. Right. Well, that that happens later. I don't think I, I'm thinking about how am I going to use this story? What am I looking for? It's much more intuitive and 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 spontaneous. It's in the moment. I just... I'll, we could talk about the characters in the book as individuals, but in general, in each case, I just found myself wanting to hang out with them, wanting to be admitted into their world because they all live in interesting worlds. Uh, and I intuited that those worlds were part of a larger story and that if I spent enough time with them and, and won their trust and got to hear their story and see it and follow them around as they live their life, it would be connected to a larger picture that was the picture of the unwinding. I didn't know exactly what I was looking for at the beginning, and that's usually how I work. I, I might go, for example, to post-war Iraq, post-invasion Iraq, um, or to Lagos, Nigeria, with a general idea of I'm going to write about the reconstruction, or I'm going to write about the mega city. But who I talk to and where those conversations lead and what picture builds, that's something I have to learn as I go. And that's the excitement of the work. It's always a process of revelation. I never know what I'm going to say until I've finished talking to people. The end of, of, of the book, this, this first book that we're talking about, you, you, are, you come to certain conclusions about where society is. And, and uh, I, I want to bring that up because it struck me as being a kind of prologue to the unwinding. And, and there were several characteristics you identified for, of the times. The main force of our lives is the overwhelming force of unreason. So, so reason has moved away from center stage uh, in the world you're looking at. There, there, is a, there is a lack of a vision and the moral and intellectual energy such vision confers. We're talking just generally now about American society, the collapse of all of the structures. You were identifying them in, in, in this book in the year uh, uh, 2000. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the kind of delegitimizing of what you call the collective self-betterment, that the people don't believe in reason and they don't believe through reason that government can solve problems. Just comment mm -hmm. on that. I mean, it, it, I, I found it, not having read the book until after I read The Unwounding, I, 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 I really uh, found it a very compelling introduction to The Unwinding. You know... It's interesting to hear those things quoted back because that was what I wrote 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years ago and that was the state of mind I was in, mainly through excavating the past, my own past, my family's past, going back to this man I never met who I was named after, my maternal grandfather, George Huddleston. Um, I think I would put it a little differently today uh, and I would approach it a little differently. Um, what I didn't quite see was how uh, the 60s was more of a prologue than the main event and how um, so much of the era we live in now, some of it was prepared for during that time, but I think most of it came later. And if anything, it's a kind of return to the, the period my grandfather came out of the period of the robber barons and of populism. I mean, what is Occupy Wall Street but a kind of resurgence of populist politics? Uh, what is, you know, what is Dodd-Frank but an effort to recreate, you know, some regulation of the financial system that, that was undone? So I think what we, the 60s no longer seems like the this, this signal period to me. Um, and when I set out to write The Unwinding, it came out of events that happened after Blood of the Liberals was written, starting with the Iraq War, which I covered for The New Yorker and wrote a book about um, the Assassin's Gate. And what I saw there was a failure of not just individual American leaders, but American institutions. Um, 
ones that I'd probably had faith in without even knowing I did, such as the military, the intelligence system, the media, mm -hmm. and Congress and, and the executive. So I began to wonder, when did that failure begin? Has it been happening for a long time? And we never noticed until we tried to do something that required all of our talents and energies, and we simply didn't have it in us to do it, to rebuild Iraq. And then I came back from that war to cover the 2008 election, and suddenly every institution in the country seemed to be collapsing. The Wall Street investment banks, you know, lenders like Countrywide, Washington Mutual, General Motors, Chrysler, my God, just the core pillars of our economic life were falling apart. And out of it came Barack Obama, who seemed like the first truly new uh, and promising national figure in a really long time. That story, which obviously builds on the history and blood of the liberals, is a new story. It's the story of my generation. And I wanted to write an account of this past generation where uh, the, the failure of these institutions and essentially of the deal that held the country together which is basically the social contract, where that fell apart and how that fell apart. So I needed to find a new form for storytelling, which is very different from Blood of the Liberals, no longer autobiographical. There is no first person anywhere in the unwinding. It is all told through the stories of my characters. That was a real departure for me, but it seemed necessary to get my arms around as big a subject as what has happened in America in the last 30 years and to paint a portrait of where the country is today. So, so you, you, you start working on this, say, in 2008, approximately, and you, you, uh, you then uh, set about creating profiles, uh, stories that people tell you or that you research, and we'll talk about it. So, so how does this, this structure come into being? We, we should mm -hmm. explain to people who have not read the book you have, uh, let's say, four main characters who are uh, people in different walks of life, uh, and you're looking at what happens to them. Uh, it's a chronological story. Each of them uh, is of a, of a certain cohort, born into the 50s or 60s, coming of age in the 70s and 80s, uh, and then living out their lives and careers in this period of real destabilization um, where things are coming apart. One of them is Dean Price, who is uh, an entrepreneur in rural North Carolina uh, in the Bible Belt, a uh, very conservative area. But out of this, this conservative background, and he's a Reagan Republican growing up, but he, he sort of latches on to alternative energy and biodiesel fuel as the, the way to revive all the, the poverty and, and to revive the troubles in, his, in the countryside that he grew up in. Tammy Thomas is a black woman in Youngstown, Ohio, who grows up amid the deindustrialization of the Rust Belt, the collapse of the steel industry. And she survives and raises her three kids by latching onto one of the few good blue collar jobs left in an auto parts factory. Jeff Connaughton um, is an ambitious young guy from Alabama who latches onto Joe Biden as his ticket to power and to, uh, to idealism, and then becomes disillusioned with Biden and becomes a lobbyist. So the three of them uh, are in different parts of the country and different, some are more successful, some are not. There is a, a kind of winners and losers dichotomy. The fourth is Peter Thiel, who becomes a Silicon Valley billionaire and a libertarian with a sort of a vision of um, a need for radical technological change in order to pull the country out of economic stagnation. And there's a fifth character who isn't a person. It's Tampa, mm -hmm. uh, ground zero of the housing bust um, and of all the trouble in the way people got into debt and got into bigger houses than they could afford. And then when it all went south, the financial crisis was the result. So five parts of the country, five characters, we follow them moving back and forth between them as their stories unfold from the late 70s to the present. That's a big package of, mm -hmm. of stories to tell anyway, 
but I also wanted to tell the stories of the most influential people of the same period because you can't write about America today without writing about celebrities and without looking at the role of the elites. From politics, there's Newt Gingrich. From entertainment, there's Oprah Winfrey. From business, there's Sam Walton. Um, from finance, there's Robert Rubin. From government, there's Colin Powell. Um, from sort of food culture, there's Berkeley's own Alice Waters. So I had this tremendous amount of reporting and research and stories. I didn't have a structure, and this is an unusual thing for me. I usually have a structure early on, so I know where things go. This all had to come together really fast um, when I began to write at the beginning of, of 2012. The structure had actually come to me earlier, but I forgot, or I discarded <laughs> it. I didn't think it could work, and my wife reminded me. You had an idea. It was to do a kind of experimental nonfiction book along the lines of the Dos Passos trilogy USA, where you would combine ordinary people and the famous, uh, the centers of power and obscure backwaters, and even a kind of mishmash of quotes and news stories at different moments to give a sense of what the collective mind was like at individual years along the way. I gave that a try. Uh, not knowing if it was going to work. It seemed like a, a juggling act, but that became the form to tell all these stories, to hold them together um, through the, the writing of The Unwinding. Uh, the only thing that I would add to what you said, and you know your book better than I do, is that in Tampa you, you follow a number of secondary characters, uh, a journalist, a lawyer, uh, a woman who attends hearings and discovers in foreclosure the, yeah, courts. Yeah, yeah, who discovers the corruption and so on. So, so let's talk about the the four um, main characters. I, is there is a is there something that uh, you found that told you about what was going on in the country that was common to all of them? Uh, which ones were winners? Which one were losers? But th they all seem to have. Uh, a, a kind of a sense of hope, resiliency, determination. It's just they're differently placed yeah. in the way they can succeed. That's a good way to put it. Um, each of them keeps running up against setbacks, obstacles, dramatic changes of course. They have to remake themselves as the country goes through upheavals. And I think that's part of what allows this disparate batch of stories to cohere into a narrative. There's some suspense. What's going to happen next with Jeff Connaughton after he quits working for Joe Biden? Uh, how will Tammy Thomas survive once her job at the auto parts factory gets sent to Mexico? Will Dean Price keep pursuing his almost religious vision of biodiesel as the, the cure for what ails the Carolina Piedmont after his partnership collapses and he goes bankrupt. So their lives are, they're interesting, you know, and they're, they're surprising. There's, full, there's lots of unexpected turns. I think what all of them are contending with is a period, which gives the book its title, in which structures that used to support these kinds of aspirations have begun to disappear and people feel more and more that they're on their own and have to improvise and figure it out for themselves. Dean Price, who is, you know, a son of the Bible Belt, his, his family had been in tobacco farming forever. His father was a fire and brimstone preacher. Um, he wanted to be a, a successful entrepreneur, he kind of rebelled against his father's uh, darker and more constrained vision. Um, so Dean Price, you know, had no organization to support his ambitions. There was no business association, no local newspaper, no trade union, no political party. What he's got is his own dreams, uh, some old books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, who was a, a kind of how to succeed in business writer from the early 20th century and the internet, where Dean finds out about things like peak oil um, and biodiesel. And he's kind of improvising and pulling it all together in, in a very idiosyncratic way. 
and inevitably screw some of it up or get some of it wrong or makes mistakes or doesn't quite know what he's doing, but keeps persisting at it. So it's this resilience in the face of, of dissolving structures that is the drama of their lives and it is the thing that unites all of the characters in the book. And, and they all are learners. I mean, in other words, they, they, they try something, it may fail, they, they pick up the pieces, and, and when given the opportunity, they move to a, a, a new level. Uh, always, uh, uh, I mean, they, they may end up with disappointment, but, but the frustration doesn't lead them to stop in their right. quest, basically. Right. And I think for different reasons in different cases. Mm -hmm. In Dean Price's case, if he were to lose faith in his quest for redemption in, the, in rural North Carolina through biofuels, he would kind of lose faith in America. It would tell him that uh, a lonely man with a dream no longer could make it. And I think he did almost give up a few times when he, when he went bankrupt. Um, for Tammy Thomas, it was more a sense that people counted on her, her children, her family, her community. She's very much connected to Youngstown as the city is entering a death spiral as after the steel mills close. I mean, my God, 50,000 jobs lost in a rather small section of the Mahoning River Valley. It's, it's as if New York City lost half a million jobs. So it was an economic cataclysm. It was happening all over the Rust Belt. So there are many Tammy Thomases in, around the country. She kept going because as she said over and over, I did what I was supposed to do. She is not someone driven by a grandiose dream of achievement and becoming a national figure or an entrepreneur or anything like that. She did what she was supposed to do, which stands in such contrast to the culture of celebrity that we live with, mm -hmm. where you don't do what you're supposed to do. In fact, you win by doing what you're not supposed to do. You, you break things, you break the rules, you cut corners. Uh, and that's the story of many of the celebrities in the book, uh, including Jay-Z. Let's talk about the celebrities in a minute. I just want to uh, make uh, a point about that comes out in Tammy, uh, which is the uh, she she is uh, through her grandmother. She gets to live in a mansion by a former uh, 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 a steel baron. A steel baron. Yeah. And what what comes out is the extent to which the barons of Indianapolis uh, of the city of Youngstown, uh, of Youngstown did not realize what was happening. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as the place collapsed, they had kept other businesses out. But then they, they, they didn't kind of understand. But she then gets, becomes an organizer and is learning by being part of uh, a community organization that takes about mapping the city to yeah. see where the... And, and so through that, she gets a, a, a larger vision of what's going on in the city. Yeah, I mean, here, here she is, a, a little girl. Um, her mother was a heroin addict, so rather than taking care of Tammy, Tammy really had to take care of her mother. She told me the story of how her mother would smoke in bed. And when Tammy was a very little girl, she would try to keep herself awake so wow. that after her mother fell asleep, she could take the cigarette out of her hands and put it out, which is a little detail that gives you a big picture of what her childhood was like. She was raised by her great-grandmother who worked in white people's homes, rich white people's homes. And at one point um, when her longest standing boss, the widow of a steel baron, died uh, and the house was in escrow. The estate was sort of undecided. Tammy and her great grandmother and her mother went to live in this giant old mansion on the north side of Youngstown where the rich people lived and it was this ma magical year in Tammy's life and then it ended and she had to return to the east side which was on the verge of falling apart when a few years later the mills closed. But Youngstown's a story of a one industry city controlled by a handful of families 
who when they sold out to the multinational steel companies, um, or at least to the steel companies headquartered outside Youngstown, that was the death sentence. No one any longer had a stake in the survival of Youngstown. And when Youngstown Sheet and Tube, which was the, the largest locally owned um, mill in Youngstown, when it was sold to Likes Corporation of New Orleans, and then 10 years later, in a vote of the board that happened at the Pittsburgh airport, People flew in to Pitt. They didn't even go to Youngstown to take the vote. They went to Pittsburgh and voted to close uh, the Campbell Works, which was the biggest part of Youngstown Sheet and Tube. 5,000 people lost their jobs. It was the beginning of the death of Youngstown, and it happened almost without anyone in a position of power noticing. Suddenly, this whole way of life ended, and Tammy had to grow up and raise her own children in the debris, in the ruins of this old industrial city. And as you say, once her job disappeared years later and it was sent overseas, she had to remake herself. It was a matter of survival and she became a community organizer and it was like seeing the city for the first time. She, what she had taken for granted while she was surviving suddenly struck her with full force. Some injustice had happened here. It angered her. She kept using the word frustrated while we drove around her old haunts of the east side. And that told me she hadn't given up. It, it still had, she had some fight and she was not willing to let go of Youngstown. And, and that spirit remade her as a, as a community organizer. Before we talk about the, uh, the, the celebrities, uh, because there you're creating a, another kind of mosaic that, that, that's quite fascinating and disturbing at the same time. Uh, Connaughton. Connaughton. Was, Con Jeff Connaughton. Connaughton yeah. was an idealist who rose in American politics on the, uh, uh, the coattails of, of Biden, who he became very disappointed in. But in the end, he becomes a lobbyist. And uh, it's quite extraordinary because it's, there's a period from 2000 to 2010 when what a lobbyist is and what a public servant is changes. So we yeah. move from uh, uh, not selling out to, I think he says, cashing in. Yeah, suddenly you know, there had been a kind of unseemliness to going from Capitol Hill to the big lobbying firms. Like, you did it. A lot of people did it, but it was slightly unseemly to being what everyone did. I mean, astonishing numbers of aides on Capitol Hill, fully half of retired or defeated senators, same number of congressmen end up in lobbying. I mean, it's, it's the obvious way to make money in Washington once you've been on the inside. Jeff Connaughton followed suit and got very rich at it because his firm, Quinn Gillespie, had connections to both the Democrats and the Republicans. It was bipartisan. It was bipartisan. <laughs> they couldn't lose. They, they used to say, we're not of the Democratic or Republican Party. We're with the Green Party, meaning we're about making money. And whoever wins, Bush, Gore, kind of didn't matter all that much to Quinn Gillespie because they were going to do well no matter what. And Jeff was the third wheel and did very well himself. But he also became a, a creature of that period. He put his money into some unwise uh, real estate investments in Costa Rica. He, as he said to me, he got greedy. He's a very honest, candid guy and ended up losing a lot of his wealth in the financial collapse of 2008. And that partly, and I think also just a sense of self-respect we were talking about what kept them going. Mm -hmm. With Dean, it was a, a dream, a vision. With Tammy, it was survival and her attachment to the people around her. With, with Jeff Connaughton, I think it was a need to look at himself in the mirror uh, and to be able to. He went back into government as the chief of staff of the guy who took Biden's seat when Biden became vice president, Ted Kaufman. And Kaufman and Connaughton did something kind of extraordinary in Washington. They decided they were only going to be there for two years. They weren't worried about re-election. They were going to take on Wall Street. And Connaughton came back into government and was sort of astonished to see it. Even though he'd been a lobbyist all this time, he hadn't seen what lobbying had done to Washington, how money drove so much of what happens on Capitol Hill, and how the public voice is hardly heard at all. 
So they went after the big banks. They tried to break them up, to reinstate Glass-Steagall, to prosecute the individual executives who might have been, you know, committing crimes of fraud uh, that led to the financial crisis. We know how that story turned out. But for Connaughton, it was, it was kind of a matter of pride and self-respect to do, to try. And um, his story is the story of Washington during this period and how Washington, even though the newspaper version, the, the, what we read about every day is it divided into extremes of right and left with tremendous vitriol and, and deteriorating norms and etiquettes. All that is true, but I think that distracts us from the real story of the last generation, which is that Washington has become what it was in the late 19th century, which is um, a pawn of organized money. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the celebrities, and there are, I think, about 10 of them. And, and we can say, first off, that the only one that comes off looking really good as Elizabeth Warren. We'll put, we'll put her aside. Don't forget she, Raymond Carver. <laughs> uh, oh, and Raymond Carver, the writer. Yes, that, yeah. That's correct. Okay. But, but I want to uh, try to distinguish them in some way to, to find a common characteristic. And one thing that struck me was in the ruins, and we're talking about the ruins, each of them found a niche, basically. Uh, and uh, yeah. in the case of some who thought the old institutions uh, still existed, Colin Powell, well, we know what happened to him. I mean, he, he was in an administration where the people didn't really care about right. the institution. I think, I think two of them, you're, you're absolutely right. right, two of them were creatures of the old institutions. Mm -hmm. Colin Powell from the military and, and essentially government service and Robert Rubin mm -hmm. from Wall Street and the, the Treasury. They both believed in those institutions and were leaders of them and didn't see the rot that was setting in. So that when, <clears throat> in Powell's case, Bush took the country to war in Iraq, and when in Rubin's case, his last job at Citigroup uh, as a very well-paid uh, executive. Fifteen million a year. Fifteen million a year to, for doing not all that much became inextricably tied to the practices that brought the economy down in collapse. They didn't see it. They didn't see their own, that, that whether or not their intentions were good, and I think in both cases they were, um, that they had become a part of something that not only no longer worked, but that was actually undermining the larger public interest. Wall Street and the public interest parted ways a long time ago, and I don't think Robert Rubin ever saw that. So <clears throat> their stories are a little more, I, I would use the word advisedly, but a little more tragic. I think the other celebrities in the book, um, what one thing that's interesting is a lot of them come from nowhere, rather like the characters we've been talking about. They come from very, Oprah Winfrey grew up in poverty in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Jay-Z from the housing projects of Brooklyn. Sam Walton from a little town in, in, uh, in Arkansas and Oklahoma in that part of the country. Um, Newt Gingrich, terrible childhood, uh, sort of a, an angry and, and hard stepfather. Gingrich was adopted. No one in his immediate family seemed capable of, of just loving him, and he became a hard man. So they all come up out of very uh, difficult circumstances, and they reinvent themselves. They, they kind of create a new way of being an American. And they, rather than building up institutions, they break them down. Gingrich comes into Congress in 78, the year that the book begins, and immediately starts throwing rocks and baiting the speakers of the House and really trying to polarize the place and to force the Democrats uh, into mistakes that will lead to a Republican takeover. He's a revolutionary. Um, Jay-Z comes out of Brooklyn and very calculatedly start selling crack in order to make enough money to launch a career as a rap star. And his story is of meteoric success, but almost success at all costs and as its own justification. So that breaking the rules isn't just something you are allowed to do, but you're something you're encouraged to do because the old way of holding down a job and going to school and putting one foot in front of the other it just doesn't work anymore. It's a sucker's game. Um, Sam Walton, 
um, institutes business practices that lay waste to retail establishments across the heartland, including in Dean Price's part of North Carolina, and turn Americans into you know, low-wage, low-price consumers and drive manufacturing, help to drive it overseas. So these are all, in some ways, uh, empire builders who are doing it in the ruins of the old and are partly responsible for destroying the old institutions. And that is a new kind of leader in this country, a new kind of elite. They're not custodians. They don't have a sense of a higher national interest. They have their own interest, the interest of the empire that they're building, and damn the consequences. And, and Walton is extremely interesting, I found, because he starts with a rural model, cheaper and cheaper prices, paying employees less and less to beat the local rural and, and Main Street competition. Yeah. And then somehow the country comes to him as yeah. it collapses in the sense that as we get more and more inequality, basically, this model makes sense, especially when the products are being made by the Chinese. Right. You know, and Walton and his defenders say that Walmart made life cheaper for people in parts of the country uh, where it was hard to make a living. They raised standards of living by lowering prices, but you could also say they lowered standards of living by lowering wages, by driving factories out and turning former factory workers into part-time store greeters who made $8 an hour and worked 20 hours a week. There's a family in the Tampa chapters of the book, the Hartzels, who end up pretty much dependent on a job like that f just to stay afloat. And they do all their shopping where? Of course, at Walmart, even though they hate the place because that has the cheapest prices. So that in a way, the depression of the heartland and the hollowing out of the main streets ends up being good for the company because it forces people to buy products at the cheapest price possible, which is at Walmart. Uh, it's a race to the bottom. Two other uh, uh, celebrities, uh, Alice Waters from Berkeley and Oprah Winford. Oprah, Win Winfrey. Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, sorry, right. I'm, I'm excited watching the clock here. Uh, the the what's kind of interesting is they unintentionally or intentionally wind up uh, responding to different levels of the society that's being created. Uh, uh, Alice, with the whole focus on eating properly and so on, which you know you suggest is kind of an elite uh, sensibility, and Oprah sort of reaching into the heart of, of people who are mm -hmm. really being hurt by where we are. Well, the, the abiding theme of this whole book and of the period it, it's about is inequality, which mm -hmm. is growing every day and nothing seems to arrest it, let alone turn it around. Even the financial crisis increased the gap between the top 1% uh, or 5% and, and the rest of the country. So that one figure that I mentioned in the book the six surviving Walmart heirs of Sam Walton mm -hmm. have the wealth of the bottom 30% of Americans, which is about 90 million people. So it's an incredible level of inequality. So that everything seems to, to feed into it. It's almost, it's like a gas that you can't ex escape. It just creeps into every corner of life. So that in Oprah Winfrey's case, her story is this tremendously inspiring one of a, a very ambitious, driven, talented, girl from the rock bottom of society willing her way to the top and becoming you know an, the empress of television and in doing so kind of living in a class unto itself the class of celebrities that's her group that's who she's comfortable with her viewers are left behind and they sort of are in a sense worshiping at the altar of of a goddess whom they can't hope to, to touch. And there's this constant sense with her that, you know, although the message may be, if I can do it, you can do it. The reality is, I did it, uh, and so you don't have to do it. You can do it. You can live through me, through my success. Alice Waters, you know, I think did some very valuable things, as Oprah also did, uh, in making Americans conscious of what we eat, where it comes from, of, of 
reminding us that food should come from where we live and that it should be seasonal and that it should not be full of chemicals. But that too has become a kind of, uh, I see it as like a way for a certain class of Americans almost to keep out the contamination coming from the bottom, from Walmart. And although its, its origins are, I think, are very positive and very strong, it's been turned into a kind of a, a code um, or even a, a rigid, you know, set of, of rules people impose on themselves in a way that, that is intensely, I think, class-driven and that divides Americans by what they eat as everything else divides us according to our, our socioeconomic level. When I was growing up, everyone ate the same kind of crappy food. Um, and today, uh, some people eat very expensive organic food, and that's all they're going to eat. And other people eat what Dean Price sold when he was a fast food uh, owner, which is to say uh, mass-produced hormone-fed chicken uh, that's cooked in, in, in deep fryers in Bojangles. So it's like you can't get away from it. It's not to blame Alice Waters, but it, it has fed into the sense that um, Americans need to wall themselves off from each other in order to, um, you know, in order to live a good life. You talk uh, in, in your first, in the first book we talked about, about whether you change things by changing the culture or changing the structure. You even quote Orwell about that problem. Right. Do, have, have you come to any conclusion as a result of, of uh, uh, this odyssey in writing this book? I think that's still a perpetual question. Mm -hmm. You know, Orwell was writing about Dickens and saying, you know, with Dickens, change of structure begins with a change of heart. He was not a Marxist. With Marx, it's the other way around. Um, I'm basically a moralist. I basically think what we need at the beginning of any social change is a, a change of thinking and feeling. And it might begin with something as simple as restoring a sense of shame and a respect for limits. Um, perhaps we don't need to exercise the incredible freedom of choice that we now have all the time. We don't need to say everything we think on the internet because it might end up having destructive consequences. Um, but on the other hand, I don't have any illusions that either this can happen <clears throat> by spontaneous combustion or that it can lead to structural change because we also need things in our in, in Washington, on Wall Street, in, our, in business, in the media to change, um, whether it's reviving old structures or more likely rebuilding institutions in new ways because things never return to the way they, they were. Um, I don't know how that's going to happen. The, I do not claim to be either a, a prophet or a prescriber. The book does not have policy answers. It's a narrative, and that was a deliberate choice. I thought we have enough books that tell us what's wrong with America and how to fix it. And somehow they're all both true and not true. We know what's wrong with America. We don't know how to fix it. Uh, the, the answers are never enough. So instead I wanted to hold up a, a mirror or to at least paint a portrait so that we could see what we are uh, within the limits of, of what one book can do. And that might be the beginning of thinking about how we got here and how it can, how it can change. George, uh, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to come here and discuss the book. I mean, it's an extraordinary book which we really can't do justice to. Uh, uh, in an hour's time, but, but thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.